Hello and welcome to an Academy in Discussion and this particular two hour special is going to be on autistic women's journeys. So um, I am Dr Chloe Farahar, um, co-founder at Academy and educator and I am joined by my friend and colleague Annette Foster who is also um, an educator at Academy. I'm joined by my sister, um, Lenara Tyler, also an educator at um, Academy, and we are also joined by Jessica Chudasama Alloway, um, which I've learned after a couple of years actually how to spell that now, which is great, um, who is also an Academy educator and our administrative manager for Academy. So hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Um, so this particular session, we've kind of decided to do this because we do keep getting asked about um, late diagnosis, so the journey of autistic people who are late diagnosed, which all four of us are, or, or late discovered autistics, um, and also because we are all women or in individuals who don't identify as male, for instance. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're doing today. We've got four separate talks. So I'm going to start with my autistic journey and each of us is bringing something slightly different to kind of look at different aspects of being a late diagnosed autistic woman um, non or non-binary person. So then we're going to have my sister talk, which kind of made sense because I lead at the end of my discussion into um, the difference between me and my sister, because while we're both autistic um, we're, and both late discovered autistics, we're very different individuals, which is, I think, quite important to show the diversity of being an autistic person. Um, then we're going to have Jessica, who's going to talk about your experience um, discovering your later diagnostic label of being autistic um, and discovering who who she is and then we're going to finish up with Annette and her journey to realizing that she was autistic and then what she's done after realizing in terms of like her PhD and things like that doing this okay so like I say I, I thought I'll start with mine and get through mine quickly or get through mine first because then we can see the different like I say the different journeys for autistic women realizing our autistic identities and how that comes about and the different things that we can help articulate um, to anyone really who wants to learn about autistic women um, and being later, later diagnosed and what that looks like. Um, here we go. Um, so for my talk like I say I thought I would start more or just talk more about for me what it was like growing up as an autistic person and obviously not knowing that I was autistic um, and then we're going to have different journeys for each of the other three speakers so for me um, growing up as I said I and my sister both weren't made aware that we were autistic we didn't really discover our autistic um, experiences as autistic or framed within being autistic until we were in our 30s um, but when we look back now or when I look back now at my childhood I think it's quite bizarre that I wasn't picked up as an autistic person I do know why because our my 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 mine and my sister's upbringing was slightly different because we didn't live with our parents we were um, fostered by our grandparents and so I think that a lot of our behaviours are then become difficult to pick apart from were we expressing ourselves in a way that was related to the fact that we were taken from our parents or were we expressing ourselves in a way that was autistic does that make sense so like um I sometimes find it quite hard to pick those things apart. And then now when you can look at it for an autistic lens, it makes sense. So um, I, for instance, um, I'm older than my sister. So I'm 36 currently and my sister's 34. So I was a very early talker, um, whereas my sister was not completely mute, but she didn't really speak much at all until she was around three or four. So that's also interesting because again, it shows you the difference in autistic presentation. So 
it's so so more complicated than saying all autistic individuals don't speak until a certain age if at all for instance or we speak really really early on and that's just the diversity of of being autistic um and like i said already so the fact that my sister and i were both taken into care when i was around two and my sister was around six months sometimes makes it difficult to separate being autistic from family struggles and things like that um and i'm not sure my sister would be happy with these pictures either but some of these pictures are actually quite not distressing as such but there's a lot of there's a lot behind the faces that you see in the pictures so unfortunately my mum and dad well my mum dressed us on this visit which is why these horrible outfits we're both wearing um but although you see us and we kind of look like we're smiling I know how uncomfortable we were like and and it's like you don't look like you're smiling so it's there was that mask already we were already trying to look different and and try and fit in with the expectations of other people um like i said i was an early talker um typically if people are early talkers it means they have actually quite early memories as well and i do i have very um, early memories i remember being very very small um, and thinking to myself that there was no point crying for my mum because I, I remember literally sitting out front um, outside of the bathroom door because my granny, who was, like I say, one of our carers, was in the bathroom and I wanted my mum and I was crying, waiting for my granny to come out to, to, because I was sad, I wanted my mum. And then I remember stopping and thinking, but I've been told I can't be with her. So there was already this logic that I had as a very small child um, I was very anxious all the time. I had a lot of, um, sort of rituals and routines. Um, and Lenara always, my sister always mentions these or not always, but we, we have these come up in conversations when we talk about things like restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior. And I definitely had them. I had prayer rituals. Um, I had other sort of what would be classed as obsessive, but basically ritual or ritualistic behaviors to make me feel less anxious. Like I could have some control in the world if I did these ritual ritualized behaviors. And it's things like, this picture is a nice picture, but at the same time, I know that that's a fake smile. I know that I'm what I felt like as a child and I didn't talk to people about it. I didn't, you know, express how I was feeling on the inside. And I'm still like that quite a lot now. Um, so my friends and my sister comment um, on the fact that sometimes it's quite hard to know how I'm feeling because I don't talk about it sometimes unless um, I really want to open up to the people that I'm close to. Lenara, how do you describe it? You always describe it as like, I don't really talk about Pri private person. Yeah. It's a very private. I don't talk a lot about my personal um, feelings or thoughts on things. Um, and I'm much more comfortable talking about my specializations, like talking about autism is how I share myself with other people and I can see Annette and Jessica are both smiling because they're like yes that's that's what she does um, and I do you know there are occasions where because I am very close to Annette and Jessica and my sister um, so I would say although you might think a lot that I'm quite a private person and I don't always obviously talk about my inner world you three are definitely three people that do know more about my inner world than anyone else, I would say, other than um, like my partner um, and one or two other friends that I have. Um, also, I had that very stereotypical thing of being an autistic child and not realising social boundaries and what you should and shouldn't do in certain situations. So I used to talk about my situation with my mum and my dad and um you know I would sit on a bus at like five or six years old and say to turn around to the person behind me and go I don't live with my mum and dad and this is why because they had to go you know I had to live with my grandparents and I would tell people everything I didn't realize that that's not what you do you know that you don't just tell everybody those sorts of things so, so then that sounds quite like a contradiction like I didn't tell people about my inner world like how I was feeling on the inside but I would talk about my situation like That's I would different. be yeah arguably inappropriately I would talk mm -hmm. about that but I wouldn't talk about actually I'm a very unhappy 
anxious child you know I wouldn't talk about those things um and actually I ended up not I, I kind of stopped talking about my situation as well so not only was I not talking about how I felt on the inside I also stopped talking about why I lived with my grandparents which was because both our parents um have mental health issues and basically pe children started being cruel and saying mean things when I would explain and I didn't really understand that but I just understood cruelty, meanness. So I just stopped. And then by the time I got to be a teenager, I wasn't talking to anybody about anything. I wasn't talking about my inner feelings. I wasn't talking about my situation, how I felt. So teenage years was actually quite distressing for me. Mm. Um, I like this picture. This is a really, again, it's kind of like, how did we not get picked up as autistic? So um, both Lin Sean the Sheep. Great. Sean the Sheep, yeah. So both Linara and I had um, extreme collecting of um, objects and things that we liked um, um, and so Lenara was really obsessed with um, Sean the Sheep at that time so this is her birthday stacking them all up right ready I don't know I don't know why you know it's, it's just doing this like ritual of keeping them all together and if you can see my bed is the bed next to my sister's there it doesn't necessarily look like it to outsiders but those toys are all stacked in a very particular order um, so while it doesn't look like it, the little cat at the front has to go with the bigger bear and, and things like that. And nobody made our beds for us. They're like hospital corners. You know, what child makes their bed that neat kind of thing? Um, obviously, I was lucky because I wasn't an only child. So I had my sister, but we only really did have each other. And again, it, it was at the time I felt like we didn't have very good relationships with other children because of us being different by living with our grandparents. But I don't think that's enough anymore to explain why we really struggle to make friends with other people, other children, or maintain friendships. Um, so, but like I say, we were lucky because we had each other and actually we both, we were both as odd as each other. So it, we, it kind of worked where we could be friends and, and spend a lot of time looking out for her in the big sister kind of way. I had very odd dress sense. These, these pictures really distress me. <laughs> so that's um, a red dwarf baseball cap. Um, I got mistaken for a boy quite a lot. Um, I had a, a thing about collecting badges. So you can see there's like a, um, a waistcoat that I've got a ton of badges on. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I had these odd dress sense. Um, not like a lot of the children around me. Um, so like I said, my teenage years were actually, I would say, my most miserable. Um, I was very, very lonely, very depressed. And, and like I say, at that point, I just basically stopped talking about my inner world um, at all. So I wouldn't talk about how depressed I was, how anxious I was, how things weren't good at home, um, that kind of thing. And this is pictures, basically me trying to fit in. Um, and this is at sixth form, which I actually didn't do very well at sixth form either. Um, and this is where I started getting the same comments that I've received throughout my adult life, which is that I'm standoffish, stuck up, stuck up, sorry, cold, unapproachable, all these kinds of things, which does make sense. If you're completely shut down, that you don't, uh, you know, open up, you don't talk about yourself at all, you don't talk about um, how you feel on the inside and you basically distance yourself from people because you find it difficult to talk to people anyway, um, then people are going to sadly think those things of you. So I do understand that now, but literally only in the last few years have I understood that mask and what I was doing. So if you think about it, from being a teenager until I got diagnosed at the age of 32 or around that time, I didn't understand why people were saying these really mean, cruel things about me because I didn't feel like that on the inside. Um, so the mask is, it, it's so important to understand that and it's been so useful to understand that now. So I've already said that I stopped talking to people about myself. Um, I didn't understand why I couldn't make friends like everyone else. I couldn't do small talk, only big talk. So I would talk about psychological theories or sociolog sociological theories and things like that, but I wouldn't talk about small everyday girl conversations. And I went to an all girls school. Um, and I remember when we went to sixth form, I remember sitting with a bunch of girls because I'd lost my one or two friends that I'd had throughout secondary school 
because they didn't go to sixth form and just sitting with a bunch of girls that I didn't know, watching them all talk to one another and just sitting with them, but feeling really outside of them and thinking, I don't understand how you're doing this. How are you having this conversation? And I remember having that thought. Um, so like I said, yeah, my teenage years um, were, were pretty miserable. I was very depressed and anxious and lonely, had extreme insomnia. Um, I was very suicidal, particularly in sixth form. And when I left sixth form, part of the reason I left sixth form was because I thought I could trust somebody. I thought I'd made a friend and I made the mistake of telling them that I was depressed and suicidal and they told the other pupils and then I was getting picked on for, for basically wanting to end my life. Um, and so I left, I just couldn't deal with it anymore. Although something quite nice happened when I did leave, which is one of the boys that did pick on me for being suicidal. He must have felt really bad that I left um, and and got the school to send me a letter from him apologising for what he'd said to me. None of the others did, but that kind of restored my faith in humanity a little bit. That mm. At least one of them thought about his actions. Um, this is um, the man that brought me and my sister up, which is our gramps. Um, and I think he's our favorite person in the whole world. Um, and he didn't know we were autistic, um, but he also didn't treat us like we were weird or, you know, he was just very caring about me and my sister and we miss him a lot because he passed away a few years ago. Um, but we're pretty sure now that we understand we're autistic, that he was autistic, which is probably why he didn't think we were weird or, you know, didn't think anything um, negative about us. And he was always um, great um, bringing us up. Um, in terms of stimming, so self-stimulatory behaviours, which um, Annette's going to talk about a little bit during her, her talk. Um, so my sister was, and occasionally still is, a rocker. Um, and that was horrible. It's like, is it fleur de lis? Fleur de lis? Sofas, like the pattern. I'm sure there's going to be some hopefully audience members that recognise that pattern. It was really particular. Um, and Lenara loved that particular sofa um, for the rocking. So just watching telly and sitting and rocking. And then um, Granny and Granddad replaced it and it didn't do the sa it didn't have the same sort of springs. And she was quite upset because she couldn't rock it. Get a rocking chair. Do you actually enjoy a rocking chair? Is it the same? I don't now. I don't do anything like that now. But when I was young, yeah. You would have liked a rocking chair. Um, so I sucked my thumb from a baby until I was about 11 years old. And I had this little strip of satin, which was part of my baby blanket. Um, and I liked the coldness of the satin. So you kind of, I would work my way through the length of the satin. So when one bit got warm, you move to the next cold bit if that makes sense, like passing it through your hands. Um, I liked the smell of it. I liked the feel of it and the coolness of it. And like I say, satin is a lovely feel for me. I, it's, it's one of my favourite feels, whereas wool is, is like my arch nemesis. Um, and I remember my granny when I was about three or four, because that, that's a, just a strip on a part of a larger blanket, and she threw the majority of the larger blanket out because it got really tatty. Um, and for years, I just imagined this other part of my blanket sitting on the rubbish dump waiting to be rescued because I anthropomorphized it. It was really important to me. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because if you, regardless actually of whether you've got an autistic child or not, if, you, if they've got a comforter, something that comforts them, please don't throw it out. Please don't, you know, if they say they don't want you to wash it, if they don't want you to do things with it, please don't. Um, because like I say, to be a child and that anxious that you can imagine the other part of a blanket waiting to be rescued on a rubbish dump is quite distressing. Um, and I never wanted anyone to take my little strip this that I had left and I actually still have it. It's like, in, um, I've kept it in a scarf, so it's sort of, stay safe and all this kind of thing um and my sister and I were quite lucky in the sense that our grandparents literally never made comments or negative anything about our stim behaviors um so we never sort of developed I don't think any harmful stim behaviors because we were always allowed to do these things without judgment um to the extent that when I went into hospital for just a biopsy um 
my granny brought my blanket with me because she knew it was important to comfort me. And I just stopped on my own volition when I was about 11 going into secondary school. So I must have on my own decided that it's not something I want the other children to see me do. But we were lucky that our grandparents didn't stop us um, because that's something um, Annette and I champion, which is the importance of stimming. And like I say, Annette will talk about that a bit more. So getting past, I guess, the teenage years, which I said were quite um, distressing for me, um, realising that I was autistic. So before I was 32 and started to really realise, I always knew I was different. I always felt lonely, um, an outsider, weird, all these negative things, um, all these negative labels were used to describe me by other people. Um, you know, so that was quite a, a tough adult a young adult life so before that yeah it was all quite negative before I was 32 and then I started to realize basically when I started dating my current partner Louis who is autistic and also has attention differences I also started seeing a lot more women um autistics describing their experiences on like TED talks and stuff like that and I identified with them and interestingly like many of us I thought well I can't be autistic because I'm nothing like my partner well no he's a six foot three bearded man I'm nothing like my partner um while we do have a, a lot of similarities because we are still both autistic I'm also don't have attention differences. So there's lots of things that go into realizing you're autistic and the things that actually stop you from seeking a diagnosis or seeking that discovery. If you base it on, for instance, the male stereotype and there are definitely male autistic. So cis straight men who mask and don't realize they're autistic till later in life which actually is the case for my partner he didn't um, get diagnosed till he was in his mid-30s as well but we're still very different people um so diagnosed at 32 and i'm now 36 i was lucky in that i was at university i was actually in my phd um or doing my phd when i fully realized that I was autistic and university can be a really it can be a distressing place place for autistic people but it can also be a really amazing and liberating place if you're finding other autistic people too so at uni I found my group of weird um, I once I started realizing I was autistic before I got my diagnosis I started going to the female autistics group that my University of Kent um, held before Annette and I took it over and now it's um, it's not a female only it's just a mar it's more of like a masked autistic group I guess um, so regardless of gender um, and, and I always tell the story of when I first met Annette um, because it was in the females group I walked in and I was kind of like I don't think I'm autistic because I don't do that thing and I don't do this thing. And so I don't think I am, but I've always struggled to make friends and I, you know, I don't have very many friends at all. And Annette who never met me before in the corner just went, I'll be your friend. Um, and then we were friends and started doing work together and investigating our own identities together and doing projects and things together. And that's something Annette and I do talk about is autistic friendship because autistic friendship can be amazing because it can be as simple as going, let's be friends. You know, it, there's none of that worrying or, you know, am I going to annoy them or I'll be friends. Should I, should I call them today? Should I message them today? Oh, why haven't they messaged me back? You know, we put in amazing boundaries because, um, I know, for instance, particularly at the beginning, Annette was really struggling with a lot of burnout. So I knew that if I didn't hear from Annette for several days, it wasn't to do with me. And I took that literally, you know, we're still friends. She's struggling. Give her her space. You know, so it's an amazing thing to realize that you can find your group of weird because all human beings are weird. If you think about a human being, they are very weird. We are very weird creatures. But once you find a group of people who are just as weird as you, then in that group, you are no longer weird. Um, so yeah, university was good for me. Um, it was also quite a struggle for me for lots of different reasons relating to autistic inertia, perfectionism, um, executive function issues, you know, all sorts of things. But it was also a really good place for me. So I met my autistic boyfriend, made my weird group of friends um, and just started to connect with the autistic community and the culture so the autistic culture 
The picture that I've got up here is um, of me and Louis. And the, the main one that says, um, so this is an old picture, which is why it says ASPE companionship before um, Asperger's was removed from the diagnostic manuals. And there's lots of discussion about why it's better and preferable for us to just describe ourselves as autistic. But that's just to explain why that says ASPE. Um, and this is because Louis has quite extreme um, auditory sensory sensitivity so we would go to restaurants or pubs or something like that together and he wouldn't want to stay because it would be too painful for him so then we started doing this thing where we got headphone splitters and we would listen to music together and one of our anniversaries we did that so we went to a restaurant and it was quite loud and noisy so we put in headphone splitters join our meal and I just remember there was a couple there's like a couple of older women sitting next to us and they I don't know what they could whether they could decide what they were staring at us for, whether it's because they thought we were rude not talking to each other or the fact that I was a shaved headed woman in a dress. And I don't know, all of it confused them, I think, but that's how we enjoy our, our time um, and make it autistic friendly when we go out. Um, so Louis can be quite a difficult person to be in a relationship with. And so can I for lots of different reasons. Um, but also there's some good things that, it can be easier to have an autistic uh, a relationship sorry with another autistic person or another neurodivergent person and my sister is going to talk briefly um, on relationships in her talk and her interest in all types of relationships but also autistic rela romantic relationships so I met Louis in 2015 um I've got here Louis plus or uh, being autistic plus his attention differences plus being handsome makes for a happy relationship. Um, although, like I say, he is different to me in terms of how he's autistic. So he has different sensory profile to me. Um, so, you know, he's quite tactile, whereas I'm tactile averse. So it's kind of it's, it's an interesting thing to try and um, navigate. For me, it's frustrating that he's a gamer and that's part of his attention differences. So he's a huge gamer. And my, um, it, I don't class it as an obsessive compulsive disorder, but I know that people understand what I mean when I talk about that. But I have very particular needs, routines um, relating to all sorts of things, but including tidying and cleaning and things like that. And he doesn't. And that can make for friction when he doesn't do the washing up the way I want it done and <laughs> doesn't put things where I think they should go and this kind of thing. And for him, because of the attention differences, things become, if he can't see it, it doesn't exist. So his object permanence is quite poor. So he ends up with multiple objects that he thought he didn't have. And I'm like, Louis, you've got five um, tape measures you don't need anymore do I? Where are those? And I have to tell him. <laughs> um, but what's really good and I think it's really important is he doesn't expect me to be neurotypical. He doesn't always understand me. Um, and he, we know we have to work on him understanding my anxiety because he doesn't have anxiety like I do. But he doesn't expect me to do neurotypical things. So he doesn't expect me to, or like I say, he struggles himself to go to bars or, or that kind of thing. Um, so unlike my past relationships who expected me to be a certain way, didn't like some of the things about me that were clearly an autistic thing. So my obsessive need to meow things and meow songs, which my sister's smiling because it drives her up the wall as well to hear me meowing things. Um, you know, and although in my past relationships, I also didn't know I was autistic. So I think to some extent, if I'd been able to explain myself, it might have helped somewhat. But I definitely think being with another neurodivergent person um, who can at least a try or attempt to understand our differences um, is really ben beneficial for a relationship. Um, and this is a huge compliment, compliment from Louis, which is I um, annoy him the least of anyone ever. And um, basically everything and everyone annoys Louis. Um, so to get that compliment is quite good. That's just me and Louis um, being silly. Um, so just finishing off um, on what are my strengths and challenges of being an autistic person. Because I'm aware that people will and do look at me and think, well, you're orally verbal and you're articulate. Um, you've managed to do a PhD and all this kind of thing. And well, you must be in quotation marks, high functioning. Um, 
which completely ignores some of the things that I might find challenging in my environment and the days where I don't do very well, when I might have extreme executive functioning issues and not be able to string a sentence together. Um, my extreme constant anxiety, which wakes me up at, in the middle of the night. And even though my PhD was submitted, um, so where are we now? It's now June. I submitted my PhD in September last year. I still occasionally wake up in the middle of the night and my brain go, your thesis, you're supposed to be doing your thesis. And then I have to go, brain, you've done it. It's fine. Stop panicking. You know, that was last year. You don't have to panic about that anymore. So my challenges or some of them. So I still have difficulties understanding other people and making friends and maintaining relationships, but not so much now that I typically surround myself with other autistic people, which just makes for better relationships for me. Um, I don't do eye contact. I don't see that as an issue or a challenge, but other people who are not autistic might be confused by it if they don't know me or they don't know I'm autistic. Um, and that's all about, I'm a very visual thinker. And if I'm looking at somebody I am too overwhelmed by concentrating on their eyes, their face, too much is going on. Um, so I have to look away or close my eyes if I'm talking to someone. I avoid social physical contact, um, again, because I'm very sensory sensitive um, or tactile sensitive, which is why I shaved my head because hair was very distressing for me. Um, so I don't do physical contact. So if anyone does um, try and do handshakes and things like that, I just go, don't do handshakes, awkward wave kind of thing to, um, you know, move it along. Social situations and actually lots of sensory situations create extreme anxiety for me. And I can come across as quite awkward. The issue with the anxiety masking, which I do less now, a lot, lot less, um, and just cognitive load of those things um, creates a toll on my body. So I'm exhausted pretty much as soon as I get up in the morning. I'm, I'm tired already. Anything um, to do with unanticipated or unexpected change um, really distresses me. I need to know. I'm a need to know person and I like to be the one typically who makes the plans. So sometimes that's good because I think my sister's not much of a planner. Uh, Annette's not that fussed about plans and I don't think Jess is either. Are you? Or are you? I, I, I like plans. I I have to do them myself unless I trust someone else. So because you're very good at plans, I don't mind you doing plans. But if it was someone else, then I'd have to be the one doing the plans. Yeah. So, and that's good. You have to have a mix yeah. of people. So Annette and I get on really well because I'm a planner and organized and Annette's a doer. Yeah. So it's great. <laughs> I'm not a planner. <laughs> um, and yeah, surprises are too much for me. And I, and I, I talk about, um, or I always, when it comes to explaining my issue with surprises, um, there's just too much uncertainty there. My brain doesn't know what's going on and it can't prepare for anything if you don't know what's going on. So my um, example is, is Louis buying me um, a giant African land snail for my birthday, but not telling me, just telling me for weeks that I was going to get a surprise for my birthday, knowing I hate surprises, but it's a nice surprise. It's not the point. It's the fact that my brain does not know how to prepare. Um, and so you know, it was very distressing on the morning. He took me out on into the street to go and get my present, which made me even more confused. Like, why was it not already in the house? Um, walked across the road to the reptile shop. And then I really freaked out because I was like, I don't know what he's bought me. That's now all the possible scenarios come together at once. Spider, lizard. I don't want anything. It's too much. I can't cope. I can't. I will have to clean it. I'll have to do all these things. And so I had a cry on the street um, and I don't cry very often, um, but I had a panic attack and I ended up ringing my sister like sobbing because I was like, I don't know what's going on. And, you know, having a panic attack. So surprises are not good. Like I said, sensory issues. So sound, smell, um, light and touch. And which is like I say, why I shaved my hair. Um, I get challenged by people not understand or me not understanding how other people view me. But like I say, coming to understand my mask, what it is and how I do it and why has helped with that. Um, I still can get misunderstood or underestimated, um, particularly because I think sometimes I can come across as more childlike um, than my 36 years, that kind of thing. So, it, which makes it difficult when you're like trying to be a professional and an academic and things like that. I still get overwhelmed, sad, and anxious, um, and but I'm hopefully I'm working through that because I've got a good support network of people um, and I've got the autistic community to understand myself. 
Um, so my strengths, I have a deep focus and concentration on things that interest me. Basically, that's autism, mental health and stigma. That's, that's all I'll ever talk about if you want to talk to me about anything. I have extreme empathy, which a number of us in the autistic community do for people and strong sense of social justice. So we get called social justice warriors, which I actually take as a good thing because we want justice. What's wrong with that? Um, I say what I mean. I mean what I say. I don't lie. Um, if I do, you'll know it's just really bad. I'm really bad at it. I don't pretend to be something I'm not, which sounds contradictory when I'm saying about the mask, but the masking was done unconsciously to protect myself, as with many of us who mask like, into later life. What I mean there is that I'm not consciously trying to trick or manipulate people. Like I say, I have great organisation skills and I do have creative thinking and thinking outside the box, which is how I ended up coming up with ideas for a PhD and things like that. So I have lots of things like that. I'm getting right towards the end now. So what would we change or what would I change? Um, I wouldn't change being me as much as I've, I might struggle, have struggled. Um, what I would change is my environment. And the, the scenario that I give to explain this is I read, um, I think it was a blog by an autistic woman who was explaining she'd always thought that she was inherently disabled by being autistic, that she was born autistic and that that was why she was disabled until she went to Japan. And because the cultural differences, the social interaction differences and things like that, she realised for the first time that she wasn't disabled. She might be sometimes impaired or considered to be impaired because of being autistic. But the only thing that she realised that disabled her was the environment because she was no longer disabled in Japan because you don't have to do certain things. You don't have to, you're not expected to make eye contact. You're not expected to shake hands and things like that. Um, I would like people to change or at least try to understand autistic people from our perspective, which is why Academy was founded, why we decided to put it together was we want to educate from autistic people on autistic experience for everybody, not just non-autistic people to understand us, but for also newly discovered autistic people to come to the, or the culture of um, being autistic, so the autistic culture, and understand that we're not ill, um, we're not broken, and we're not in need of a cure. So, And that's actually, at this present time, what the research is demonstrating. We are not classed as Ill, having an illness or a disease. We are classed as having a neurodevelopmental condition. So you can't cure the neurodiversity of humanity. Um, just because a behavior doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just not your kind of weird. And so while you might see me and my friends and people who I'm close to doing things that look bizarre to you, they make sense. So stimming makes sense when you understand. So if I see one of my friends doing a certain behavior, like sometimes this little behavior can indicate to me that that person's anxious or uncomfortable, right? Um, and that's a really amazing thing to learn about that person that they don't even have to tell you. You can be like, okay, what's going on in the environment? How can we change it if they're anxious? So for instance, lying is seen as normal, is seen as a normal um, part of development. Um, you know, it's a normal neurotypical behavior that many neurodivergent people or autistics don't necessarily have or do. That's not to say that all autistic people don't lie, but the point being that what's normal about lying, it's, it's a very bizarre thing when you actually think that it's normal to lie. Some stims appear harmful, but they may serve a purpose. So it's about learning the language and how do you then reduce that um, harmful outcome? Um, so while it might seem damaging for an autistic person to headbang, um, you need to understand what that's saying and what, what's going on for that individual to reduce the likelihood of them harming themselves. Um, because actually a lot of neurotypical non-autistic behaviours like smoking, um, biting your nails, you know, all that kind of thing can actually be very harmful, but they're seen almost as expected or not as, not as taboo as some of the behaviours that autistic people do. Mm. So my summary is to be autistic is to process our environment and social interactions differently to those who are not autistic. 
This can create challenges when the environment and those around us are not suitable for the way we process. This does not make us disordered or broken, just neurodivergent, which can bring with it strengths. There are many ways we can manage our differences so that we don't get as stressed and ultimately the environment needs to adapt. Until then, we can find one another and become part of the autistic community, which is what uh, we on here are wanting to do, which is why Academy and some of the other programs and projects that we do, like So You're Autistic, um, aim, aim for. So if you want to learn more in terms of education um, or training or anything like that, um, Academy, we have lots of training there from us and also the So You're Autistic program that Annette and I founded so we do all sorts of things and currently we have a video up for instance about the violent meltdown fallacy we've got one coming up on pos positive autistic identity um, and i'm actually thinking it might be good to do the neurodiversity event for children and families online so we're going to look into doing that together mm. um, and this is just to make you aware of how to find the positive useful autistic information for you that's not built on negative pathology or pathologizing ideas about who we are so typically and stereotypes and stereotypes yeah and typically if it's a neurodiversity symbol um look into it but that might be more um a good indicator that it might be an okay source than anything that like lights it up blue puzzle pieces so there's lots of issues with those things on this side so like autism speaks go and look into it don't ask autistic people to educate you on this there's lots on this already online and some of these things are quite distressing to keep being brought up again and again but they're basically for us hate symbols so now we're going to hear from my sister Lenara on her autistic journey to realize yes. she's autistic um, a bit on the issues of being bullied for being different and the impacts that can have later in life um, and a bit on what she's learning and learnt about autistic relationships so not just uh, uh, friendship relationships but also romantic relationships all right okay what you talk, talk about when growing up you mean like school and stuff first I guess, I mean, I can help with this bit. So I could be like, just as like a little bit of a host for it. So let's just press start. Um, so I guess when it's like saying about your journey to realising you're autistic. Mm. So I guess, how did you realise you're autistic? I think also because I was, um, I was a mute at school, so obviously not talking. Um, you know, I, I didn't talk from an early age and I did really, I hated going to school. So I used to just end up, most of the time I was on my, I was on my own, like playing and just like, I didn't really sort of want to socialize or talk to anyone. And, um, cause I was quite quiet at school anyway. I, I, I did get bullied quite a lot. I think obviously when you're young, you think you're getting bullied because like you're ugly or, you know, you just, do you know what I mean? You just hate yourself, but you know, you're quiet and you, cause you're not social and you're seen as weird. So, Obviously, that was hard um, being bullied because I got bullied since like seven, um, right up until um, like even well, even now, um, even in relationships, like being like for me, I think being uh, ha having a point, it's like a trigger for me to be for people to put down like looks or any flaws or something because I'm quite um, I'm quite responsive to. Or I just rather not have people make comments. So you know that about me, Chloe, don't you? So I don't like physical, like negative comments. As again, so maybe since I was seven, I remember when I was at school. I think I was in the nursery. I think I was like because I'm dyslexic. I was in like learning support, and I remember being really young, say seven or ten or something. And I remember this boy coming to talk to me, and I thought he fancied me, so I was really excited. And I was sitting with like a. Um, well, I was waiting for my support teacher to come in and he said something like, um, what does Miss, I can't remember her name, Miss Smith teach you, teach you how to pick your nose if it's long enough or something. So it's something like that or like, and I got, and then he started calling me Arvark and stuff because I had a long nose. So I think like, um, that's traumatized me quite a lot. Like even in this, my adult life is just complete. I, I think more, I think being dyslexic traumatized me as well. Because obviously some kids at school crawl, so they'll ask you, um, you know, 
no, that part, if I could, if I took a longer time to tell the time, someone asked me what the time was, I'd be just, you know, that whole rush of insecurity and horrible feeling if I couldn't answer. And then I'd get bullied for it and be called dumb. So even later on in life, when I work, or I've, I've worked at jobs and I couldn't do pick something up as quickly. Um, that's in the back of my mind that people are thinking that I'm stupid all the time, but it's constant. I think for me now that I think more sort of, I'm more confident in myself, but I think when it comes to learning something or trying something new, I, I, I don't think I can achieve anything. If it, I used to pull it off. So if I brought a shelf and I'd had to pull it up, I'd leave it and leave it thinking I can't achieve that. So there's no point. Or like when, if I went for a job, I'm not going to apply for that job. I'll just leave it in like the, the waiting, the list to, to apply. And I never applied because I just thought I'm not going to get this. And I just think I'm just going to fail at everything. So, so for, for me now, it's not necessarily, my confidence is more since leaving school. Um, I got more confident, but with jobs and stuff, even the simplest jobs, I'm thinking I can't achieve it. So it trauma, I think, obviously being not understanding you're autistic and just thinking that no one likes you and you're ugly and weird. And then I think that trauma is still there with me. It's because it's learnt behavior. And I, I, I met someone recently that sort of said, you know, you shouldn't let your past determine your future, which is so such an annoying thing to say. It's so one is NT and two, it's like built in you because that's all you've known as a, as an early child you know, the trauma, and, and it still stays there. So it's hard. I think with me, more like I, the, the masking, trying to please all the time in jobs or um, in them sort of situations, even with friends, I end up. When I asked you to do this and I said what I'd like you to talk about, initially you said you really didn't want to talk about being dyslexic at all. You don't mind talking the about... Brilliant bullying you don't mind I don't mind the physical thing no I just don't like the the dyslexic thing I don't know why it's something that goes in the back of my head like don't tell anyone I'm dyslexic and I, I hate that I don't like that but you know I mean, even now I feel awkward but I, I, I think because it's it's like you know just being dumb and not being able to achieve something when but I think yeah. it's you said it's difficult because not only were children cruel about you being dyslexia I mean they obviously didn't really understand what dyslexia was but they just saw it as you being in quotation marks you know stupid um, or dumb or what have you um, but it wasn't just the children you said sometimes the teachers would be quite... oh yeah yes yeah, so I went to a, a learning because I, I wasn't good at maths so I went to a um, one of them learn direct places I think that's what it's called and tried to do maths before I did a course and um, she was getting frustrated because I couldn't understand something. So I just said to her, well, I don't understand it. So I don't know why I've got to force myself to understand something that I can't. I'd rather just not bother. I don't see the point in, in trying to achieve something if my, my brain can't do it. Mm. I'd rather just not bother. And she was just quite, she got frustrated with me. So people have tried to get frustrated with me. I, I think I remember granddad tried to teach me to drive. I was getting really frustrated. I remember just... A lot of people, even in past relationships, if I can't pick something up, or even if, even if in relationships when they, they criticise you or if you if you felt something wrong or in text, I mean it's happened to me recently, and they'll keep picking up like you know that's not how you spell your, and like I, I get what they're doing there. I mean if you can try and help someone, but it's the way people go about it. It isn't it, to me. It just makes you feel like great. Like I'm insecure now. And I always a, just think you know what I mean. So why are you? <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah. And it's like, it's like they're trying to put it again. I'm uh, with me. If I know someone spells something wrong, I don't do that. I don't, I, I think if that was me, I'm not going to correct someone. Because what, what are you trying to gain out of that? Not a teacher. Do you know what I mean? But it's hard because you still, I, I happened the other day um, and I spelled something wrong and it's like, that's not, that's not how it's worded. And it's just like, all oh, right, you know. And a um, horrible feeling of like, you're judging me thinking I'm dumb now. And I'm glad that you have decided to talk about it, even if it's only just a little yeah. bit, because it's, and I, and I know it's really hard for you. You really, I know you really didn't want to have to talk about it at all. Um, but it's so important that people understand this. Like other children need to be taught about neurodivergence. They need to understand that some children, because of the way their brains work, 
won't be able to manage numbers or spell in, in the same way as everybody else. Um, you know, all this kind of thing, because it has had such an impact on you. Like you said, mm. we can talk to you about being autistic and you can talk about that. Or even ADHD because people say I talk too fast, so I don't want to. <laughs> but the dyslexia thing has really stuck with you because of the negative way that people have since you were really young. Yeah, and not being able to achieve something you really want to achieve. Because now, if someone makes a comment about appearance-wise, um, um, I'm trying to think if I've had I've gone on dates or people said, oh, um, someone said I look anemic or something. A so comment like that, I look at the source of where it comes from. And I think these people are projecting, and I can kind of or negging, whatever you want to call it. But I can kind of deal with that because there's nothing expected of me. There's no, if it's a job or it's something I want to achieve, that's a different kind of feeling altogether. Now, I don't care about comments. I, I honestly, I don't feel like that, that way so much about comments. It's literally just that not being able to achieve something, thing, more, you know. So that that's, that's why. What would help to... If you wanted to achieve something, depending on what it is, obviously, what can people be, what should be p people be doing to help you feel that you can actually do that? I think people aren't really patient, are they? And they, uh, they haven't, um, I don't know, like in, in a job, I, I worked in a sandwich bar uh, about three years ago. And I remember the manager, he was a nice person anyway, but he used to short change, like he, he'd accidentally not give out the correct change and I did it once. So in front of all the customers, there was like a, 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 a few young blokes in front and that he just said, I'm really thick. He was like, oh, you're so dumb. And I, or something. And then he was like, oh my God, you're so dumb. And then I said, um, I'm dyslexic. He was like, that's just an excuse for being like really stupid, like really thick and that and really dumb or something. I mean, he swore, but I'm not swearing. <laughs> and then I just wanted to just run upstairs. I think I got emotional actually. I think I... I went in the toilets and I think I actually cried <laughs> about it because I can't, it's just, it's just a horrible feeling, isn't it? Like, and then he, he done it so many times, but as soon as, you know, and then I, again, what is the need for that? Yeah. I mean, I, on the whole, I'm autistic, I'm a dyslexic as well in my whole life. You know, people have been frustrated with me trying to teach me things, trying to make me understand, um, and the word stupid is, is very big in my brain. It's part of my inner, you know, rhythm of talking to myself and it stops me from doing things all the time. Just like you said, I just put things aside. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll, I put things off. I procrastinate things because I'm afraid to do them because I'm afraid of failing. Um, yeah. Failure is the worst. Mm. Or even just like apologizing for being who you are. Mm. Terrible. Yeah. And I apologise for be, not being able to understand your brain isn't, my brain isn't, doesn't work that way. I can't, can't do it. So no. I, I have this philosophy of like, stop trying to, you know, some people go, oh, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. I've had people say it to me, you can, you just, you just stop your, you know, you just uh, stop yourself. But it's like, sometimes you just can't do certain things that other mm. people do. I don't think it's, I think it's unfair to try and put that in your head as well. Like to, you know, like, oh, you can, you're just, putting all these mm. that's very it's such an empty thing to say as well isn't it all right you can do anything you put your mind yeah. well yeah. i can't do algebra i'm not gonna try <laughs> i mean my study tutor i mean i'm doing a phd i don't know how i'm um, still feel like a procrastinator and uh, that i'm an imposter but my study tutor get frustrates with me you know just over yeah. stupid things like I can't remember my passwords, I, you know, or I'm not writing something. So we don't work on anything because I'm not doing the one thing that every, I, I, I don't know. Sometimes that, that is. And you so, feel like you just don't want to do it. You want to give up. And that's the worst thing. Yeah. You don't want to get, but I, I couldn't think of anything worse than doing education now. I couldn't think of anything worse for me anyway. But the I thing that's frustrating about that is that you are good at lots of things, but the yeah. problem is it, it almost feeds like that negativity and that traumatized experience feeds into the other things because, you know, you could, uh, you could have at many different points decided to open like, um, like a Pilates class and things like that, because you did do really well and learnt, um, interest. What was the course? I think I have got a uh, PT course. I have got, um, qualifications and stuff again. It's like, you know, um, I mean, I, I found that easier doing multiple choice stuff. When I was doing like tests and stuff, I couldn't do a, I know you mentioned it once, me to do a PhD or something once. 
but that. also I mean, anxiety just... but you just said that it puts you off education for instance but the thing is yeah. you're actually very very knowledgeable on about on a lot of things and you do research you do autistic research into the things you're interested in and become People very relation. knowledgeable yeah and become very knowledgeable about them so it's just that your strengths are in a certain or certain types of areas things that i'm interested in yeah yeah so what about your autistic journey? So realising that you're autistic. Can you actually talk? Because we haven't talked about that a lot, actually, me and you, really. Um, because you, when I decided to look into being autistic, like getting into the diagnosis, you were kind of like, I don't... Because you obviously, again, like all of us, had a stereotype of what autistic people look like. I didn't think you was. And I was like, I remember working thinking, you're not you're going for the test and she's not going to be autistic. Yeah. And then we hadn't even considered that you were like obviously autistic and had attention differences. We hadn't even considered that. And for, I can't remember why we started to then. So what happened? Can you think what happened for you to realise? When Obviously when you spoke about it and then you told me I was, but I was, I didn't think about it a lot. But okay. <laughs> I wasn't like, I was a bit like, I was a bit like, okay. And then I realised, and obviously as time goes on, you start to think, okay, that's why. I do this um, and ADHD, this is why I do that. And then this is why I'm impulsive or I, people have said to me, I don't think for a speaker I'm blunt or, um, you know, so I never used to be able to give eye contact at all. And I never used to like being served in a shop. And if I go to a wedding or something, I want someone else to go up and get my food. I just want to sit there. I don't want to, like, I don't want to get on a bus. I think if I get on the bus and get on the wrong stop. Do you know what I mean? Like literally like simple stuff like that. I hate that new I hate just the unknown type thing, you know. Mm. And then you realise as time goes on that, oh, that's why this person said that. So that makes you feel a bit better about yourself when you realise that's it's not person. It's because they don't understand something. So and you mm. can't relate to that person. Right? You can't relate at school to NTs and stuff. Or that's why that didn't work. Relationship didn't work out. I, I like that understanding. A lot of people, a lot of people I speak to, don't like. Obviously, because they don't understand. They don't like labels, do they? So I've had that quite a lot recently. Like, why do you always label? It's because of that. Why you always? Why don't you just say you're just being you? But it's like, I'm trying to... I like that label, and I'm trying to explain my experience. And they don't get that, do they? They no. just don't get it. They're like, you've got to stop labelling. And it's like... And then they're putting... All, all, already, they're trying to tell you not to be yourself again still. But they're already labelling you. And, and that's what's yeah. been the trauma, is you've been labelled with all these really... Again, like me I had different labels but you've had negative labels like lazy or stupid or mm. you know talks too fast all that kind of thing so you've already had all these negative things thrown at you as labels whereas like you said to be autistic doesn't have to be a negative thing at all yeah I'm and you get like... to explain yourself and then you can and then but then some people just, because they don't understand, or they refuse to understand, that can be difficult in that environment as well, isn't it? And you can't really, you, again, you're still not relating to people because they're not willing to understand. Um, but it is hard. I think more, I think, I think now, I think more as time goes on, I think it is harder for me to be around people. I, I mean, I just always think I had to be around more people and have like, more friends and just try and make effort. But now I'm more, just rather have my own company now. I'm happy with that. And you, you said about obviously when you were small, and we've had this conversation before, because we're pretty sure that your daughter is also autistic. She's nine and very similar. And in a lot of ways, she's very similar to you. And a yeah. lot of ways, she's very similar to me. She's more confident than I was. Like you're, you're sort of saying when you were young, you couldn't, you, you spoke more about yourself more and as you got older you kind of went in and I'm the opposite now I don't care what I say and I don't care if I don't care I'm, I'm not a private person so I just say everything that's on my mind and I don't keep anything to myself and I think oh, she don't like it <laughs> but you we've had to ha we've had issues haven't we with with your daughter who really struggles at school is to, to fit into that neurotypical environment and she she feels like she can't make friends so she'll just hide in the toilet at the lunchtime which is really sad and just cries so that's just really sad and I, i'm hoping to get her homeschooled anyway but at the same time she doesn't feel she can relate to some of her friends can she or, or people 
Well, she's more like I was, which is she gets on better with either much younger children or much older children or adults, but children her own age, which is the same as how I experienced when I was younger, that you, you just can't get on this. You're not on the same wavelength. Um, and the thing is, she's she's very academically capable but it's the social element that's really, really difficult for her. But what I said, what I was thinking was really interesting is you didn't, you weren't that fussed about people as a child, were you? You said you would quite happily play by yourself. I'm a bit like that now, still. That's learned learned behaviour. Can you say more about that, like when you was a child? Like what what was childlike, apart from obviously the the distress of, of being picked on for being dyslexic and stuff? Can you think about what it was like with the autistic lens now, as it were, like thinking about... I, I didn't um, like it when they said you had to partner up with someone and it was like, I don't know if you remember, I don't know if Annette or Jessica had to do this, but you know when they ask you to like do PE in your vest and knickers? Do you remember that? Hmm. Do you remember that horrible experience? I, I, don't, I can't think for autistic people anything worse than having to do that. I thought, I'm not going to be in my vest. And I so was, that made me anxious. So I, and then straight away, and they said... You had to do skip to the loo, and, and that memory sticks out to me the most because nobody wanted to partner up with me, and I just cried and thought, like, I just mm. don't want to be here. And I remember just thinking every day I wanted it to end. The um, everything about it, even right from right from nursery, I just wanted yeah. it to end. And there wasn't one day that I avoided. But when I was on my own, I was all right because I was on my own. No one was judging me. But again, like at the playground, so if I was on my own to chill in or whatever. I mean, I did make friends. I did have friends and stuff that it was weird. Because I think I remember I had like two male sort of friends. But I, even then, I didn't want to really bother with. You know what I mean? But I remember thinking just that one memory and then not getting picked for stuff. You know, when you don't get picked because I didn't like sports. I didn't really want to do rounders. I got picked last. I didn't want to do it, you know. <laughs> I just remember thinking I've got a pair I've got no one to pair up with and I'd rather just die. Mm, That's a horrible feeling. And and relate. And you used to have a, a much better imagination than me because I was always jealous of your imaginary friends and because I couldn't do it. I couldn't But I, I I'm not sure. I always thought I was different to you. I'm not sure if I'm PDA. I, I don't know that. I mean I obviously I've been told but I'm not hundred percent sure. But I, I knew I was different from you a way of thinking from you. So then I used to think, well, I'm the weird one that you wasn't. So, so it, I think I used to, you know, what you say, I used to play with toys and stuff and used to always um, have a good Im- imagination. Not so much now. I don't really have a good imagination now. Unless, because it's something I wanted to do, maybe. Maybe I now. Always, I, know. I was always jealous that you had Jack Dusty in the summer and Jack Frost in the winter and, and I just couldn't do it. It, it wasn't logical. Who needs like friends? That. Sorry? Who needs friends when you've got imaginary ones? But you still I, do. But we did play together. And I know, this is a thing which makes me distressed as well, is that how people would perceive you, no, or knowing now how people were towards you. Because I always just thought you were my cute sister. And, I, and we Didn't got on that, well yeah. until we were teenagers. And then I was miserable. And teenage years are never that great, regardless of, of who you are. Um, but then at school, when people were nasty, you would come stick up with me, so it's fun. You did your bit. Well, yeah, because <laughs> I, I didn't. It was. It wasn't. It wasn't right. It wasn't just to for, for you to get bullied, and so that made me really angry. Yeah. Um, but and I, and I and I am glad that we had each other because otherwise, we, I think if we were sing, um, uh, yeah. What do you call it when you've got no other children, no other siblings? Only children. Only children, yeah. Yeah, only ch- you know, if we'd been only children, only childs, um, I think I would have been incredibly miserable and lonely. I think also as well, when because you said, you know, we brought up in care and stuff with our nan and that. I think also you think, don't you, that you're weird because of that. The people are outcasting you because you're like, oh, look, you're, you're, oh, look your mum's old because it's your nan turns up. So then you think it's that. You think that's the problem they don't like. I mean, it's weird. It's weird. I mean, I, to teach, I mean, obviously it's parenting, but you think, for God's sake, don't you? Like, how, how these kids are judging you for not being brought up by your grandparents and stuff, which they did sort of make fun of. I also think that we, when you don't really understand why you're different, that you will, we, we 
put logic Automatic. there. Yeah, you're like, oh, well, yeah, it must yeah. be because of this. Like, you want to understand it. Um, but we just come up with maybe the, the not co- correct conclusions because Millie has had the same thing when she was much younger coming home saying, I can't make friends. Is it because I'm ugly? Is it because of this? Which is really distressing to hear. And she was really unhappy about it. So then we obviously... You think, you think your personality is not likable and, that, and that, uh, your personality is your makeup, isn't it? So it's like, oh, well, they don't like my personality. Well, you know what I mean? You think it's not good enough. But I think we've been luckier with Millie in that we understood that we were autistic. So we got to sit with her and you sat with her and said, it's not that you're ugly. It's not any of those. I mean, she's not ugly anyway, but it's not any of those horrible things that you're thinking about yourself. It's actually that you're probably like me. You're probably like Auntie Chloe and autistic. And that's what this means. And she was much happier. I think she has more confidence as well because she can just get up and, and, and sing in front of the whole school even though no one's asked her to she just like say can I sing the song I made up today and I can't do that before all that even now like, you know she's so cute even mm. so, and, and in terms of understanding your autistic self um because it's only been a few years obviously since I've been diagnosed and you realizing that you're autistic although you haven't sought a diagnosis at the moment um you've come to be well you've always been obsessed with social um, relationships haven't you and I think also if something affects me I want to learn and understand it so if I've been in a relationship where it's affected me or you know met someone that's got say like attachment I know you don't like disorder but it's attachment problems and stuff like that and I like to research because it's affecting me directly or like if you meet a narcissistic person and just I think them personality um I'm very yeah at times I'm really interested in any way and relationships and stuff because obviously you can see where you go wrong in relationships and I was very impulsive like I've said before and um I've not always made the best decision so then you can learn about yourself can't you and do you think that and being in a neuro is it neurodivergent relationship um that's obviously hard as well as well as being a neurotypical but I, I want to learn about it and then because you can only change yourself you can't change the other person so that's my interest. Um. I found that quite interesting though, that since you realise you're autistic, you've started to look at your relationships and how you are in the relationships with that lens, I think has helped you go, like you said, just now, you just said, you know that you're impulsive and that. And also trying to, trying to be in a, being in a neurodivergent relationship, trying to, trying to make it a neurotypical one is never a good idea. And I try, and I think you you do try and, because you see everyone else doing these things, what you're supposed to be like. I don't, I find it very hard, conventional relationships. And I, if I'm honest, I don't really like being in them where, you know, you live with someone and then you, you got to get married to them and, it's, and you're seeing them all the time. I don't, I, I don't ever want that. I don't, it just, it just doesn't really, I don't enjoy it. I don't, I need my own space and stuff like that. And that's, that's what I mean. And then, you know, you can realise then that you're, it's just just learn about different type you know it's just hard isn't it i think for an autistic person to be in a complete conventional relationship i don't know if that's all because i feel like you're still learning about yourself and how to be in relationships with people understanding that you're autistic so have you got any advice of like what works you think or or if you're neurodivergent in a neurodivergent relationship i think obviously respecting because it's all about compromise, isn't it? And it's like respecting each other's like the like space and stuff. Because obviously, again, yeah, because I, I was in a neurodivergent relationship nine months ago, um, and I knew obviously when I was trying to make it a neurotypical one, and I wasn't respecting, um, or not even respecting, what's the word? Accepting maybe um, his. Um, being him, his like his own needs and stuff as well, so that I that I can see. Obviously, it really upset me, and obviously afterwards you realise that you you see your faults and where you went wrong and stuff, and not. And obviously, if it was the other way round, being autistic myself, I would like them being respected as well. And I'm not obviously saying I know obviously relationships are compromising. I think it's black and white, but I think um, you just need to. So the question was the advice. I think you just got to try and understand 
what it's like for that person's autistic experience. And just you know, just understand their perspective because it's really hard. Even being autistic, it's hard to put yourself in another person's shoes or see their perspective anyway. And sometimes it's hard for self-awareness. But I do think you can learn if you're quite self-aware and that's what I've done. So I've seen my faults. I think being impulsive is the one thing I'd give advice in relationships to being impulsive. And that's very difficult. But I've learned now not to be impulsive in that nine months afterwards, even with anything, with friends, with decisions. Because um, ultimately being impulsive led to that relationship ending. And obviously it takes a long time to deal with that, even, it was even a, now. It, it was a long-term relationship. Cause how, how long was it? Six I, years, but it was, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard years, like, was it six years before... Um, and, and you only realised you're autistic during the relationship. Yeah. Because it was always interesting because you would say to me, because you knew he was autistic, or well, well, we're pretty sure, cause, and he had a brother who was autistic as well. And then obviously you starting to realise you were autistic, but you, like say, were trying to do more like a neurotypical understanding of relationships because you would always say to me when, say, you fell out with him, why doesn't he just come round with flowers and I said, or, or not even that, or just 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 turn up to, um, yeah, just turn up. Like yes. I, 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 yeah. But and I would always try and explain, but he doesn't think like that. He doesn't. Also, have that yeah, and also of, I think as well because I know separately he he, he was a, he had attachment like problems as well. So obviously, it would be a lot of pushing away to to protect himself, his own feelings. Um, but yeah, I used to ask why he could do certain things all the time, but he just couldn't. He just didn't think of that. He didn't think of them. Um, but also, I I was just reacting. I used about things that probably weren't even there, issues that weren't there. So you can learn after, which is unfortunate, but it's okay. good to be <laughs> self-aware. Thank yeah, you. I think also, I mean, I... I think it's important to know that w that you're autistic when you go into a relationship. And I tend to tell people almost very quickly that I'm autistic um, because that makes a difference for you and for them. I think in some ways you were probably, like you said, thinking about what, it, what a typical relationship is supposed to be um, instead of thinking about it in another way, because that's what you grew up with that's what people say relationships are like see it around you don't you? you see all your yeah. friends married and whatever yeah okay thank you very much Linara. okay so we've heard from my sister and now we're going to hear from jessica and i've asked jess to talk about her autistic journey and adult diagnosis so so how you've gone through the process and where you've how you realized you were autistic i guess and wanting to hear about um your synesthesia because i find it fascinating um and about you connecting with the autistic community so i'm kind of trying to get us to cover different different things okay chloe you know i'm really terrible at really broad questions let's start with my um my autistic journey yeah so i think from quite a young age my family like my mum my sister and i um we used to sort of joke about being autistic, not like laughing at being autistic, but because we all masked a lot we, and we were very clearly autistic. We thought it almost didn't count as being autistic because we thought our mask almost was the real us and the auty bit was sort of like us pretending. It was, it was quite strange to think of it that way around because our mask was what we showed to other people. So that was like our actual person. Um, and it wasn't until... I'd say the problem started after about GCSE because I was quite academically able. Um, I always knew things before they were teaching it to us, so I didn't have problems. And it was only when I was in A-level uh, that I then started struggling. And because of my mask of being able to do everything, they didn't see the real me um, that struggled with things. And in A-levels, it was sort of seen um, to be sort of my issue with maybe not, not trying hard enough or... Um, deliberately isolating myself because it wasn't their fault at all because I was very much hiding um all of my struggles but that's just the way I'd lived my life um I had my mask as like the main me um so I then left A-levels and when I went to college I did a lot better just because I was again 
um, more able to do the work there. But I remember reading on the website, um, the lecturers at college had put up a, um, a document that was supposed to be private. And it was basically where they'd like um, written a little bit about how all the students were doing and they didn't realize I had access to it, which obviously I told them once I'd found it, but they'd written about me that I was academically able, but that I was deliberately isolating myself and deliberately trying not to make friends. Exactly. And the, the real thing was I was actually getting bullied at college because, um, because I was different and I was really struggling to connect with them. And they sort of saw that as my issue that I was isolating myself, but that was just to protect myself from, um, from being bullied and being made to feel different. Um, so yeah, so then I went to uni and I still obviously know I was different because I had that tough time at college. And I think it was, um, after my first semester at university, I said I was struggling. And so they thought, you know, maybe you're just like dyslexic or something. So I had, um, a dyslexia test and the lady was really lovely, but she was like, look, you're not actually dyslexic. You're sort of a little bit dyslexic, a little bit dyspraxic. That's not really your main issue, but I can see you need help. So I'm going to write in your report that you need help with something, but I don't know what it is. Um, so she did that and I got mentoring and study support and I was still really struggling. I had, you could call them friends. It was more, we were a group of people that all didn't live on campus. Um, so we were all a group of people that didn't have friends. So we were just, there was like a cheerleader. There was a nerd. There was me being an autistic. Um, there was somebody else who was a mature student. We didn't fit together at all. We didn't have any of the same interests, but we just sort of hung around together because none of us had friends. And that was when I started really struggling. And so I was talking to my disability advisor and I think I happened to say about how I joked with my family about being autistic. Um, but I'm not autistic because I, I can mask and I know these things are weird and autistic people don't know those things are weird. That's, that's um, what I grew up believing, which obviously isn't true. Um, and she said, you know, we have a group of people that are very similar to you, an autistic social group. Um, and I agreed to go, but <laughs> it took me a few weeks to go because again, I thought everyone there was going to be people that didn't know how to mask or that they didn't know they were autistic. They didn't know they were doing these um, like stim things or strange things. Um, but then I did go and I realized, okay, I am autistic. So it was good. Um, but I didn't get my diagnosis until... So I did, it took five years to do my degree and it wasn't until my very last year that I got my diagnosis. And in that time, I was still struggling a lot with things. Um, I wasn't particularly aware that maybe I was autistic. So I've so gone maybe three years through uni thinking I wasn't or I was just pretending to be autistic um, in my downtime. I don't know. Strange way of thinking about it. Um, and because of other mental health struggles that I've had, I've um, seen various doctors and things and they thought, you know, maybe you have psychosis, maybe you have this, maybe you have that, um, all these trauma responses. And I didn't really know what was happening. So that's why it took me longer to do my degree. But as soon as I got my autism diagnosis and realized that's um, actually what was going on, I've been a lot happier. Like I haven't felt as depressed because I'm not trying to have this persona all the time that isn't me. And um, I know that I am trying. It's not that I'm like lazy or not trying hard enough. It's genuinely that I have all these difficulties so I felt a lot better about myself since being diagnosed autistic yes and that's the point as well is that a number of the students at the university who are autistic have much either different or longer um university paths so mm. it's not it's not abnormal to be doing a three-year degree over five years yeah kind of <laughs> I mean yeah, in it's not it's not like everybody's doing that, but I did have friends. But I think it's not that everybody else didn't have difficulties doing their degree. It's just that because of um, how I'm autistic and the extent to which things affect me because of my autism, I think, and my difficulty with like regulating emotions, something that might have been a little blip for someone else it was quite difficult for me. And because um, they didn't necessarily know what my mental health condition was, it's been, I spent a very long time being sort of treated for each thing. Um, so it took a lot of time for me to get the appropriate help for each sort of step in the journey. And I think that's why it ended up taking me quite a bit longer. I I d and I remember the first time you came to the social group, actually, because it was before Annette and I ran it. Um, mm -hmm. And it was ran by... Um, uh, Natalie Savage who was an amazing autistic ally um, and really good for for the group and you were very quiet mm. and obviously knowing you now 
you're not quiet you and I don't mean and I don't mean you talk, <laughs> I don't mean in quotation marks you talk too much I just mean that you are an open person you chat to us and we have conversations and things so I do remember you being very quiet so yeah. is that like you say because you weren't sure you should be there or that that we weren't going to be the people similar to you or something yeah I um I think it was lots of things so my mask generally growing up was quite quiet because um I had a very difficult home life um so like my ex sort of stepdad um he was quite abusive um in all ways but like verbally so some of the things he would say was that I was really loud and obnoxious um I was stupid so the combination of those things if you're loud obnoxious and stupid you think everything that you're voicing is something that people don't want to hear um, so my mask was generally to be quite quiet because I thought that made me a lot more likable, um, which isn't the case because obviously, um, like I said, at college, I was very quiet and that made me seem standoffish and all those sort of um, things when that wasn't how I wanted to be. That's just how I thought I should be so that people liked me or so at least didn't dislike me, if that makes sense. So, yeah, going to new places like group, it was difficult because I didn't know if I was going to get on with people. But then also I had this mask. Um, I think I did spend quite a few weeks just being very quiet and Natalie would ask me if I was okay. I did a lot of origami and colouring and just, I was listening to all the conversations and having a really nice time. I just didn't know how to engage in a way that wouldn't make people dislike me. It was really difficult sort of discovering who I was and um, just sort of knowing that being me was okay. Yeah. And I'm talking about myself as well, but it always makes me really sad because you're saying like, you know, you struggled to make friends, people, you were worried people didn't like you or that you felt that they genuinely didn't like you. And my sister's had that experience. Annette, have you had that experience to some extent? I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> so for my experience, um, especially as a teenager or as a child as well, I was um, definitely people did not like me. I remember being about 12. So I was going from year six to year seven, which in America you go from something like primary school to middle school. Um, and these girls that had been my friends my whole kind of childhood was like talking to me in the bathroom and they said, if you don't change your attitude, we don't want to be your friend anymore. Um, and that really, really affected me. And I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, and for some reason, I didn't feel that I had even the, I couldn't even ask them, okay, what, what is this attitude? Um, I just kind of thought, well, fine, I'm not going to be your friend then because if you don't like me for, I, I guess in some ways I was quite self-confident. I was like, if you don't like me, I'm just not going to have friends. I'll just go about my business and do what I do. Um, but it did really hurt me. And it, I, I thought about it for a very long time. I was put, picked on in high school as well, um, a lot. And told I was too sensitive to everything. Um, so, and I've definitely had people in my life that have not liked me, which would have, has upset me. Um, but I think that's why I feel really sad about that is that I don't think that all four of us get on with one another and connect with one another because we were outcasts and couldn't make friends with anyone else. Like I genuinely like Jess. I genuinely mm. like mm. Annette and I genuinely like my sister, which not all sisters are necessarily and siblings like one another. They might love one another, but I actually like my sister, I like her personality. That doesn't mean we don't clash sometimes or I might get frustrated with any of any of you. But the point being no, I don't think we're unlikable. I think it's genuinely, we just have to be around people similar to us because like I say, Jess, it, you are a, a lovely person. You're one of my favorite yeah, people. And so it makes it very difficult to understand that it's, it's non-autistic people not understanding us. Mm. Yeah. So, so going from you being very quiet in the group and obviously, I remember when you did start to talk, you would talk about definitely autistic experiences you have and had, and you would always have this joke of going, but I'm not autistic at the end of it, which I loved. Me and Annette would find that really fun and funny because you, you were saying it in the sense of you knew you were autistic almost as well, and you were doing something that was definitely autistic. So it was really amusing. Yeah, I think um, it grew out of having that real belief because we thought if you could mask 
that was the real you and if you knew it was weird then therefore it actually couldn't be autistic because we just didn't understand the concept of autistics sort of knowing they were autistic um and it, it just grew out of that and um when i was then more confident with who i was and um accepting that i was autistic letting my stims out more and that sort of thing it just sort of developed into a joke <laughs> you are very funny thanks yeah. <laughs> no, you are you've got a great sense of humor so what has been part of that journey then? So you just said about letting your stims out more and stuff like that. So going from that very quiet Jessica who didn't think that you would fit in with the other autistic people to now, how many years ago was that then? The, was that two and a bit years ago? Um, I think it was the first time doing my second year. So it was at least, yeah, about three years ago, I would say. So like 2018, 2017? Yeah, about that. Yeah, just before Annette and I took over the group, I would say, yeah. So well, what's, yeah. what's your adult journey been like in that time then, I guess? Like, what's changed? In that time, yeah, interesting. Um, definitely being in the social group of autistic people, because it, um, people could relate to what I was saying and um, genuinely accept me for who I was. And I think being in an environment where there was less pressure to interact in the first place, so because... I could be quiet or I could talk and people were completely happy with it either way. Whereas um, in a normal social situation, you can't just sort of sit there and it looks like you're ignoring people. And so they don't necessarily want to um, interact with you. And that puts on a lot of pressure. And that's when the mask comes out. Whereas this gave me um, like the environment where I could not have a mask and it um, gave me more confidence over time to let it down more and more. And then because I don't have my mask on, I'm generally happier um, I'm less depressed, less anxious. Um, and then that makes the mask come down even more and more. Um, and it's, it's, it's like a, a really nice cycle. Um, so yeah. And, um, it was, so it was the social group and then also doing SYA, which is your program about learning about being autistic. Um, that was just really positive and happy. And it again, just reinforces all of the messages about stimming and why you do it. And, um, it's a really positive thing to make time for and um just yeah just sharing experiences with other people that were late diagnosed and that sort of thing because you went through our so your autistic program twice and it was but it's useful as well because you started to really just be autistic self in those spaces it then allowed it for other people in the group as well because obviously as much as Annette and I are like you can do whatever you want in this space you won't be judged as long as you're not running around naked you know um and so I remember, it is definitely you, isn't it, that you, you sat behind the curtain? I did, in one of yes. the Can you explain? Yeah, so I was, I was having a bad day. I think I'd had a lot of bad news. Um, I was quite stressed out with uni work and stuff. I'd been in a lot of meetings with sort of advisors. And um, I knew that if I went home and was by myself, because I was living by myself at the time, it would have got worse and I would have sort of spiralled into a worse depression. And I knew that group would cheer me up, but I just couldn't face talking to people. I couldn't face people asking me, about my day and that sort of thing so at the time group was being held um in a drama studio that had curtains all around the edge and i came in and i was like hey guys i'm here but i'm not really here i just want to listen i want to be here but i don't want to interrupt myself and i just went and sat behind one of the curtains in the drama studio and i think at some point i took my shoes off and laid down behind it and it was really nice we, obviously other people weren't getting anything out of me being there <laughs> but it was nice for me just to sort of um all the happy vibes in the room I could pick up on and I could listen to other people's days and stuff and I felt like I was communicating in the way that I could manage at the time and it was really nice and slowly throughout the session I think we were there for about an hour and a half um throughout that I felt better and I was able to come out and talk about my day and just feel a lot better and I went home feeling not depressed at all feeling not stressed out um and I, I definitely wouldn't have if I'd have gone home straight after rather than going to group and interesting, and you said you weren't communicating but, or, or contributing, but actually you were. You that's, were. That's what I'm saying. You, <laughs> you doing that and feeling comfortable to do that, that you hopefully knew nobody was going to judge you or think it was weird or anything like that in that space is really important and positive because it shows the others. And yeah. the others are like, that's okay. I don't get judged for that in this space. Yeah, I guess sort of, yeah, setting an example of... Um, being comfortable to be yourself. I, I do that in a different way in group generally now because I talk about being called obnoxious as a child. I now sort of own the obnoxiousness, but with obnoxious like hilarity, like I'll quite happily be a bit of the clown 
um, and just sort of be loud. But it does encourage other people to come out of their shell. Um, and I think that's really nice because I enjoy it. And then I sort of, they enjoy it because they can then feel free to do it themselves, if that makes sense. And Jess has been helping me with SYA that we're trying to run a little bit online for some of the students um, because Annette's been furloughed. So Jess is helping me out. And I said to you, you know, I need you in that space because of your talkativeness and your, you call it obnoxious. I don't, I don't know what word I want to use, but it's definitely not obnoxious. It's you Amazing bringing people into the conversation. An, an, animation, an, being animated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah i don't know what other you, words to use other than obnoxious <laughs> you help bring people into the conversation whereas i'm a mm. little bit more reserved so it's nice to have that and because of the types of groups that annette and i run and the spaces that we have it's so important to have a mixture of people because there mm. are some very quiet people it's nice to because you actually do help then bring people out of that sometimes so it's, mm. it's a really important thing to have i think mm. definitely also, I think you being behind the curtain was somehow entertaining to all of us, <laughs> even though we knew you weren't well, it, you know, yeah. it was, Jess is still there, but also showing, you know, that we don't, everybody has bad days and that's okay, you know, and actually if it helps you to come and just lie behind a curtain with us, we're totally happy with that. And hopefully other people can do that too. Yeah, I think it was quite good because um, we were, we all were and still are sort of laughing about it and it wasn't the case of you were laughing at me for being behind no, the curtain which like no. neurotypicals would I was yeah. definitely I knew it was a very strange thing to do but it's what I needed and you equally knew that it's yeah. what I needed but it was quite amusing um yeah. and we still reference this so yeah it was a quite <laughs> nice little in joke of me being behind the curtain <laughs> but it's lots of things within those spaces isn't it because I mean I do want you to talk about your synesthesia but I guess at the moment we are actually kind of talking about connecting with the autistic community Mm. because obviously we understand one another's things like experiences so yours of um lingering at the end like you don't like when sessions finish and mm. groups finish the lingering part yes so can you tell us what about that yeah so i really don't understand and don't like um when you're in, even in telephone conversations but especially in groups if you're physically there or um, when a class has finished and everybody stands up and you're free to go, but nobody goes. And I don't understand that. I don't know what you say in that moment. I don't know. Because if you start talking, you might say too much and then people want to leave. Um, or you might not say enough and it seems rude. And I don't know how to say bye <laughs> and leave in, a, in the appropriate way. So um, my new thing that I started doing, I just sort of start backing away while waving and everybody knows that I'm going. Um, and I recently got a shirt that, um, it's the Homer Simpson gif of when he sort of um, backs up into a hedge and just disappears. I feel like that's how I leave rooms and that's how I'm comfortable to leave rooms and everybody knows that's how I'm leaving and they know I'm not being rude or trying to be rude anyway. Um, that's just how I'm comfortable. <laughs> and it's good because people, like you say, people get to know that and they recognise that and so... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah and, and if I see you start doing it I'm like oh okay Jess is leaving bye and then you're like okay somebody's given me permission to leave almost so then you can just go kind of thing yeah. um, which always um, amuses me and yeah the, the Homer Simpson's amazing <laughs> and we have a we have identified that in lots of people I do it I definitely do it and you'll just see a group of autistic people kind of all kind of wanting to go but not wanting to go and that whole kind yeah. of and, and that has to do with inertia isn't it and the whole idea of change and you know you know you know, okay, I'm going to have to stop doing this and move to something else. And we find that really difficult to kind of change from one state to another. So, yeah, so I wanted you to tell us about your synesthesia. Okay, jump straight in with it. So I didn't actually realise um, this was a thing until quite recently as well. And I, oh, I didn't know it was related to potentially sort of being autistic and other things. But um, as long as I can remember... I've seen people as shapes and colours, not necessarily, like, I obviously see them who they are, but in my mind, I instantly know sort of what colour and shape they are, and they're just sort of very much associated. Um, like you'd know A is for Apple, I know that, like, red square is for Chloe. It just, it's something that I know. Um, so generally, this is something I worked out quite recently, generally people that are um, neurodivergent 
are regular shapes. So I have a square, an oval, a circle, a rectangle, triangle, and a pencil shape. Sometimes there's other shapes, um, but people that aren't neurodivergent, so people that are neurotypical, they'll be um, like a sort of swirly blob or an irregular shape, or um, they might not have a shape, they might be a colour, but they're generally quite spiky. And um, it's hard to explain because I don't choose who has what. It's just that I sort of naturally know, I think it must be based on my initial impressions of them and that kind of thing. And then I also have colours. Um, most people tend to be um, like yellow, green, blue or red. Um, but I have met a few lilacs and lavenders. I've met a few um, like pale yellows, pale pinks, pale blues. Um, yeah, I can't explain it. <laughs> it's just the way it happens. But it, when we when you started speaking about that, um, it, it really interested me. And we started making a joke about it as well, didn't we? About how you'd make a really good diagnostic tool you know yeah. diagnoses <laughs> and take time and people have to be on a waiting list and all that kind of thing and I joked about how we could have like um, um, a shape sorter type room where the person would just walk in and Jess would just like a dousing rod just like yeah. point you at them and you'll go you're a regular square and blue uh, welcome to the autistic community and they can get out go out through the shape door kind of thing um, and Obviously, Annette's going to talk in a bit about um, her projects and her work and things with her PhD. But um, Jess was part of Annette's work, um, the Adventures of Super Super Auti Gang, and we obviously thought it would be fun to use you as a diagnostic tool. Um, the can, you, can you explain your part and what we did yeah. for that? Yeah, okay. So we wanted it to seem really funny and homemade. So um, we gathered a load of cardboard boxes, and I was sat in a cardboard box with a little cutout bit. We had a sign saying synesthesia diagnosis device or robot or tool or something. Um, just written in cardboard sort of like hanging off of it. Um, and I had these little bits of paper um, with most regular shapes on it. Um, some that just said irregular shape because irregular shapes are difficult because there's so many different ones and a color. And, um, and as people coming in to take their seats for the show, I was looking at them, getting what their colour and shape was and handing them the piece of paper. Um, and I did, so as to not to offend, I did ask if they were neurotypical or not. And if they said they were neurotypical, I did give them a regular shape. But there were a few people. I was like, mm, you're actually a red square, but you can have a irregular shape. <laughs> and I think I found that really interesting because I always wondered, was it that you had to know them for a period of time and that kind of thing? And when we did the show and you were getting confronted with complete strangers who you'd never seen before. So we kind of, I had a clipboard and we were asking people as they came in, are you um, autistic or neurotypical? And if they were neurotypical, they got a sticker. Um, and I did that because I didn't realize how good your synesthesia was for people you've literally just seen in front of you and I remember because you obviously sat quite low down in your box they would come up to you and you wouldn't see their sticker and you go to give them a neurodivergent sticker because you could yeah. see they were neurodivergent mm -hmm. and then see their neurotypical thing and go okay no, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> we need to talk like you that. know we need yeah. to talk but um, you, you also did that in the show because you wanted neurotypical people to understand what it's like to be labeled um, physically yeah. Mm. Yeah, which was, was amazing. Funny. It was an amazing thing. Yeah. Um and just um for the last few minutes, do you have any thoughts on going back to the connecting with the autistic community? So do you have any thoughts on the autistic community, what it means for you or how you've interacted with it? Um I think it's probably the best thing that's ever happened to me was to sort of become involved in the autistic community um, or in communities just because of the amount of confidence that's given me to be me basically which in turn has made my anxiety and depression a lot less um, it's helped me learn a lot more about myself and about other people and I think I've become a much more understanding person um, with regards to like the different kinds of neurodivergencies and um, even within people being autistic like there are so many different types and it's not that I was sheltered from it before like I definitely knew things but you know as I was saying about how I thought I couldn't be really autistic because I knew I could mask um so I've become a lot more understanding I've 
met a lot more like a bigger variety of people that I get on with I have so many friends um that I wouldn't have known otherwise if it wasn't for the autistic community um I it's just sort of changed the direction of my life and how I feel about my life I think it's really amazing yeah because you're now going to go on to do a master's in advanced child protection I want to do my master's in yeah and and you've been doing work with us um and currently doing a lot of work for um Harry Thompson yes. to um and and because bef- when you were thinking about whether you could do it or not there was still that anxiety of can I do the things and yeah. because I knew you I was like you can do the thing <laughs> you can do the thing I think it's from my jobs before because when I've had jobs in the past they haven't known that I'm autistic and so I've had to mask and the easiest thing that I've known probably from school is that I have to already know everything so that I don't get confused when they ask me something or I don't have to ask multiple times because I don't want to come across as stupid and that's really stressful to if you start a new job obviously you get trained Mm. you don't have to already know everything but my sort of default is that I must know everything and so that was my worry going in um to working with Chloe and Harry but obviously they know I'm autistic they're also autistic so they understand me and it's just been really lovely to not feel like the stupidest person in the job or all that sort of thing because I know I can ask questions I know um that they understand that I can have off days I can um have burnout and that kind of thing um it's just a really nice experience to change my view of what like the working world is and um how you can be accommodated as an autistic person I think that's a good point to end on yeah because <laughs> I think you need to disappear don't you I do, yes. Okay. Yes. One minute. I know. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, Perfect. Jess. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Jess. Okay, so um, we've obviously heard from Jessica now, and now we are going to hear from Annette. And so Annette is going to talk about adult diagnosis and misdiagnosis, um, a bit on her work on her thesis, so needing to articulate um, women, women non-binary and trans people's experiences of being autistic um, and then you're going to talk about the importance of stimming for autistic culture and then we're actually going to end with a short mindful stimming session so everybody who's watching we really really would love it if you took the time at the end with us to do the mindful stim and to do it as much as possible in the way that we are articulating so and the reason for that is to we're going to discuss the importance of stimming and understanding why autistic people and children adults and children sorry stim um and the importance of not trying to pull children or adults out of that focus when they have it okay so i'm going to leave it to annette and i think annette are you showing some slides yes My name's Ned. I am a multidisciplinary performance artist. That means that art has really been my passion um, most of my life and has has helped me in so many situations um, from the time I was a little girl and I love just to to do crafty things. I used to spend hours just making bracelets with uh, with uh, string or with at that at the time. Um, we used to use uh, telephone wire, we used to twist bracelets, all sorts of things like that, that just um, was very stimmy for me and allowed me to kind of stay calm and um, um, enjoy my life. I'm also a PhD researcher and an autistic self-advocate. Um, and um, this is an applique, um, one of the first appliques I ever made for my um research when I kind of discovered at 39 years old that I was autistic. Um, And I felt it was really important to, for me to articulate my experience in a creative way, in a crafty way, um, to kind of understand it differently. And one of the first things that I did, and one of the first things that I realized that in a lot of the books that I was reading, which were by um, clinicians, psychologists, neuroscientists um, that there was a lot of negative language about autistic people Um, and actually a lot of the books made me feel really horrible about myself because they were saying things like I didn't have theory of mind I didn't have any empathy Um, 
And then autistic people, you know, couldn't even explain their experience because they couldn't be trusted, you know, all sorts of different things. And one of the things I really wanted to do was to have a positive self identity about being autistic. But from reading all that stuff, it was very difficult to have any kind of positive experience of being autistic. So I wanted to make my own things to kind of counteract that. And I started making appliques and I got very obsessive about it. So I made about 30 appliques, all different. The first one I did though was autism is awesome. And one of the reasons why I made all the squares different colors was because of my personality at the time. But thinking now it's like the autistic community is so different, but also because I'm dyslexic and I wanted people to understand what it's like to not be able to read something right away, to have to really concentrate on something um, and kind of see the world differently how I did. Yeah, I was late diagnosed when I was 39 years old. I had no idea that I was autistic, basically. I had had mental health problems my entire life. Looking back, as even as a child, I was very, very anxious. Um, I found social situations very difficult. I hated school like Lenora did. Even though I was quite good in a lot of ways in school, I absolutely hated any kind of social time or unstructured time. Um, lunch rooms were horrendous for me. And, uh, and now I look back and think, oh, it was really loud. It was really smelly. There was loads of people. You have to talk about shit that's boring. Um, so yeah, looking back, I, I, I really agonized um, in my teenage years and I was really unhappy and I was very depressed and anxious. Um, and that kind of continued in my life. And I was, I was misdiagnosed with a social anxiety disorder. I think that was the first thing that I was misdiagnosed with. Um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar. I mean, I did experience depression and anxiety and a lot of those things kind of fit, but I always knew that's not quite right. I don't think that's it. But I didn't really know what was going on. So I was trusting um, people that were talking to me at the time. And it got to be, I was about 35 years old. And I was like, you know what, all this counseling, all these antidepressants that I'm on, it's still not working. And I need some help. I need, I need somebody to talk to. And I just, it took me about 10 years through the NHS, just asking my doctor over and over again, you know, there's something not right. I need to figure this out. Um, but they would say, oh, yeah, but you're, I mean, a lot of times it's funny because when Jess was talking about, oh, you know, you know that you're not autistic, so you're not autistic. And a lot of, they would say that to me, like, you know that you're, you're depressed, so then you're not depressed, um, <laughs> which really pissed me off. Um, but, but finally, I got to talk to um, a psychologist and they were like, and I started to explain, you know, all the things that were upsetting me. And a lot of it was to do with executive functioning and not being able to do the things that other people could do. Um, not being able to, I'm really bad with my sense of time. So, um, I, you know, being late for things all the time, but also not being able to organize my time, um, missing things, um, not being able to do the amount of work that other people could do in the same amount of time. And she was saying, well, a lot of the things that you're describing sounds like you might be autistic. And it was the first time I'd ever thought about it, heard about it. Um, and I ended up going for a diagnosis, but the first meeting I had with a psychologist who was really amazing, um, we both sat across from each other and I said, I don't think I'm autistic. And she said, I don't think you are either. Um, but by the end of the, the, I had about six sessions with her and we both were convinced that I was. Um, and it took me a long time. I was diagnosed, I'm 48 now, so almost 10 years ago. Um, and at first I kept questioning, maybe I'm not autistic. Maybe I'm not this because I don't do that because I'm not stereotypically this. I don't, don't do that. Um, and I didn't identify with a lot of the books that were being written at the time because they were quite negative. Um, I masked very, very heavily. I'm like, I'm a performance artist. I've learned how to mask um, and I've made it a career basically um, to be able to perform for people and um, to please people um, and kind of be a chameleon in a lot of ways, um, depending on the social situation that I'm in. 
Um, so I found it very, very difficult to take that mask off and discover actually who I was in some ways. Um, I found the idea of stimming really disturbing when I first um, was diagnosed and the way that people described it. And now I just think it's an amazing thing and then all I'll just stick to, well, everyone should do it. Um, <laughs> um, but I think a lot of people will have that experience, especially when they're late diagnosed and they've masked their whole life and they've kind of hidden a lot of elements of who they are um, from the world because they, they got teased, um, because they were picked on, because people told them they were stupid, because people told them that they were weird. Um, and it took me a long time to unpick those things. But I did discover that actually um, the benefits of, of discovering you're autistic is about coming out as autistic and the freedom that is. And, and as an artist, I kind of always articulate things in that way. Um, one of the things that I did is I did a performance where I stood out on a street, and this is actually in Nottingham, with a sign that just said autistic. And to some extent, I just didn't want to be invisible anymore. I wanted it to be known that I was autistic and that was out and that was okay. Um, and that not all autistic people look one way. Everybody is different. So I, you know, I thought, wow, I really want to have autistic pride and I didn't yet. So I thought, how can I do this? And how I, it was very hard to find a community at that time as well, to, you know, to meet people and, and, and be able to talk to other autistic people. Cause I'd never discussed my, my experience of the world and, and that actually it was different from other people because I didn't know that I only knew my experience. Um, but once I discovered that I was autistic and I started making art about it, I realized I wanted to do a PhD um, as an artist and, um, and looking into um, the autistic experience. And my PhD was actually kind of, it, in a lot of ways, being discovered autistic changed my life. A lot of ways I ended up getting divorced, um, which now I think, okay, that was good. Um, my partner and I were kind of grew apart, but they also didn't understand why I couldn't do some things that I'd done before. Um, and I found a new career. I moved um, to a new place and I found new friends. Um, and, and my life is so much better for that. So my PhD was actually about articulating women, cis and trans and non-binary people experience of being autistic through performance and live art. And through this community, I, I, I found that, you know, finding coping strategies from other people to help me maneuver through a neurotypical world, um, instead of trying to change or be normal, which hadn't worked for 39 years, um, and masking my difference was really important. And I really, I realized how important autistic culture is, um, autistic community is, and language. Because if you don't have the language to describe your experience, you're not going to be able to talk about it. Um, and the only way that happens is talking to other autistic people and realizing, oh, wow, you do that? I, I thought I was the only one. Um, so one of the first things that I did as part of my PhD was um, create a performance about my experience of being autistic. Um, but I thought it was really important for me to kind of discover what my experience was and articulate that. And before I kind of did a, um, a series of workshops with other autistic people. And one of the things that I invented as part of my show was a overwhelm avoidance device, which was a backpack that had a pop-up tent inside. And when you felt overwhelmed or anxious, maybe in a crowded place, like you're walking down the high street, and there's shops everywhere, people everywhere, um, and it starts to get too loud and too bright, you could just pop your tent up, get inside, and just mellow out for a little bit. And then when you feel better, you could then pop your tent down and put it on your back and go about your way. And you can see here, this is me um, kind of getting into the tent. Um, and um, yeah, so the other important, I, I guess for me, um, quite intense part of the show was that I was wanted to show people 
the internalized depression and how important it was to know that. Um, and what I did was I took all the words that people said to me, um, invisible, weird, too sensitive, rigid, deranged, unfriendly. Um, and I wrote them on my body, um, kind of like a skin, like a second skin. <laughs> Um, and at the end of the performance, I took my costume off and I, I showed people this vulnerable kind of inner depression. Because what happens is you use those words, those words are said to you, and then you use them against yourself um, over and over again. And they become parts of scripts, you know, and saying that you're stupid and weird and hysterical um, becomes normal to you. And what I did ask audience members to do is I asked them to write um, some of those words on my back to make them kind of feel complicit, you know, that, that we do this to each other all the time. And at the end of the performance, I actually scrub with a quite a, a rough brush, all that, those words off my body. Um, but the scrub brush makes my skin red. It's not an easy process and kind of showing that actually it's very, very difficult to get rid of this internalized depression once you have it. And can I so, quickly, for that last yeah. that last one, and I think that is yeah. it is one of the most important, I think, and powerful parts of the work that you've done, because me and my sister, for instance, have this conversation with different people again, where they say, "Why do you want to label yourself? And you shouldn't label yourself. You're just you. You're just." And it's like, no, being autistic, having the autistic identity and making that something positive and prominent for us is a desperate attempt, a good attempt and an important attempt to wipe out all the yeah. negative things that have already been labeled yeah. to yeah. us. Yeah. We've been labeled our entire lives. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and this is a choice that we can say, actually, no, I'm autistic. I'm not all those other things. Um, and to be a part of a community of people that um, embraces you and embraces that, um, which is really important to you. Um, so the workshops, first, uh, the series of 10 workshops, and it was basically about um, getting people to articulate what their experience of the world is. Um, and one of the ways I thought might be good to do that was to teach people how to applique and kind of have a sewing circle where people felt comfortable. They were doing something and they didn't have to have eye contact. Um, they could concentrate. Um, they could do something that was positive, but they also could felt free, more free to talk. And so I asked people to kind of create a, uh, a phrase or a word that was positive about them being autistic. And a lot of people found that really difficult. A lot of autistic people find it very, very difficult, especially late diagnosed autistic people, to come up with anything that's positive because um, they're told by doctors and everyone else that they're, you know, they're, they're disordered, you know, they've got deficits here and they're this there. And um, so it was, I felt it was really important to do something like that. So, um, yeah, these are some of the appliques that people did. Weird as heck. This participant um, just made a t-shirt that said, don't touch me with a little heart, which makes it. Um, and, and that's about, you know, not being wanted to touch because some autistic people find it very difficult and very painful to be touched. So why should they be touched? Uh, you know, they're not hurting anyone just to say that. So that, that, that was really good. And we did lots of other things as part of the workshop to get to people to talk about, especially their sensory experience of the world. I would really concentrate on that. So after the applique workshops, we, we, each session was um, centered around different sense, uh, sensory experiences of the world. Um, oh, so after the workshops, we then were, I decided to kind of create a performance and I wanted it to be about not just my experience, but other people's experiences uh, of, of being autistic. So I got a group of people together that was part of the workshops and um, they became part of Adventures of Super Aughty Girls. And you can see Jess there and Chloe. Um, and they were part of the, the show. And that was all about people kind of having pride about being autistic and sharing their 
ways of being autistic, which everybody is very different. And uh, one of the things Jess did was synesthesia, but she also talked about toe walking, which was amazing. Um, and and how toe walking was was the best thing ever. Themes and the findings that emerged from the Super Audi Gang workshops um, were, these are some of the things that came out of it. And one of the things was sensory experience was really important to autistic people and also was the cause of a lot of behaviors that autistic people do or the, you know, the unusual things that people do. Um, sound and smell in particular to the workshop participants were very traumatic and some people had so many traumatic experiences with sound and smell that when I put workshops on for those things, they, they expressed a lot of anxiety about coming because they were worried it was going to be too loud or there was going to be too many weird smells in the room. Um, stimming was incredibly important. Um, there is as much joy in stimming as there is in anxiety. Stimming is really an autistic language, a mode, mode of communication that's kind of, I think, been ignored and oppressed. And it, we also noticed that if participants were stopped harmless, um, harmless stimming, like rocking or hand flapping, because that seemed weird, then they, they took on more harmful stims, like biting your nails, scratching, um, biting your cuticles, um, all sorts of other things like picking your skin obsessively um, that actually was very harmful, but it was more acceptable to a neurotypical um, world, um, which just in the long run meant that, you know, another thing of clenching your teeth. So these are things that are more acceptable, um, but harmful to autistic people. So the only way that we found that autistic people could Kind of because a lot of people came to us and said we have to have these harmful stims how can we stop doing them and what we realized was you can't stop autistic people from stimming you can only you know maybe encourage them to stim and do stim for pleasure and stim in a fun way um, um maybe with um toys and or other things depending on what you want to do but um that was really important thing that we discovered the little arrow is gone. Okay. The other thing obviously was community. Community was incredibly important um, for autistic people to have other people that they can relate to and truly be themselves around. And just talked about, about that a lot. Um, just the idea that you could go into a social space and not have to talk if you didn't want to, um, or you could talk as much as you wanted about one thing and that was okay. And half of the participants were non-binary tr and trans and, um, and that was really important to understand that actually a lot of autistic people are um, LGBTQAI um, plus um, and, the, and the, the, a lot of autistic people might be non-binary or trans um, and that's that's kind of uh, really was elevated in, in the workshops. And we also found that there was a biological male that came to the workshops that was trans um, and they had very similar experiences to the group and 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 actually they identified and 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 fit in very well to the group and I, I think that's been a really important part as well of what you've done with your research and then projects you and I and papers that you and I are writing, which is that we shouldn't be gendering autistic experience because while no. we um sort of advertise this particular talk as discussions with autistic women it's just the ha it just happens to be that we are autistic women but that will be like we say males non-binary trans people etc who do also identify with some or all of our experiences too and so we shouldn't really go from one extreme to the other where we think there's this such a thing as a male autistic brain um or experiences or um um presentation and there's also not just this female presentation either it's not about being male and female it's about the masking whether you're a masked autistic or not whether you have an internal type autistic experience or a more external type autistic experience and i thought that was really important that came out of of the work that you did yeah and you know i actually learned so much from the group and i actually talking to them you know when i was their age i didn't have the opportunity to say because i never really felt male or female I felt very ambivalent about my sex, my gender, um, but that wasn't a choice when I was their age. And I, I kind of realize now that I 
I, I am non-binary and I identify with a she, they, um, which I didn't know you could do either until I uh, talked to the group. Um, and, you know, I, I've learned so much about myself um, by doing these workshops. And I thought that was really important. This is STEMI. And if you look at the definition in the diagnostic manual, sensory processing differences explain the need for repetitive and, um, and routine, repetition and routine. Um, ultimately, if you are overwhelmed by the sensory world, in some ways, stimming becomes the reaction to that and the way that we, we regulate our, our sensory experience. And part of this repetition includes self-simulatory behavior or stimming really interested when I was doing my appliques, as you can see, here's another applique of the part of the brain that is, um, is kind of the antenna or satellite dish to the brain for sensory information, which is the reticular formation. So I created a version of this on the floor of my performance um, with electrical tape. And you can kind of see it in this image here. And I got um, audience members to help me demonstrate what an autistic brain is like and what a non-autistic brain might be like um, when it comes to sensory information. And this is the autistic brain in kind of overwhelm. So, you know, so much information going around in their brains that in, in, impossible to, um, to not be overwhelmed sometimes by the sensory world. So once you realize that the way we all process sensory information is different, to non-autistic people, it becomes clear why we experience the world the way we do and why non-autistic people often fail to understand us. Um, and this is actually an image by an artist, um, Meredith K. Ultra, who's inkanddaggers.tumblr.com. And they've done a piece of work called Respect the Stem. And they've drawn a whole series of it, which I think is great. And the person has a tangle in their hand and they're playing with their hair. But I just really thought that was an amazing image. Um, that I found. Um, repetitive behaviors and thoughts and needs for routine and sameness make sense when you experience the sensory and the social environment as loud, smelly, bright, painful, and all over chaotic. Oh, the arrows are back, yay. Um, so what is stimming? Stimming is the autistic community name for stimulatory behavior, which basically refers to any behaviors or activities, both physical and cognitive, which autistic people do consciously and unconsciously to regulate our sensory world. Interestingly, all human beings stim. Um, so if you're going to sit in a room full of neurotypical people, you're going to see people playing with their hair, shaking their foot, tapping the table. They'll be doing all sorts of things. And to a neurotypical person, that's just fidgeting or squirming. But actually, um, the autistic word is stimming. Um, so all, all, it, all human beings do it. It's not something that just autistic people do. Um, autistic people might do it more because we have more sensory um, sensitivities that make it that we have to regulate our sensory experience of the world more than non-autistic people. There's different types of stimming. Um, there's so many different types of timing and these are just a few. Yeah. So we can rock, we can spin ourselves or objects. We can flap, we can jiggle our leg. We can flick our nails. We can shake our feet, bounce or jump up and down, play with our hair. Um, echolalia, which is basically repeating a word over and over that you like. I know Chloe's word is sausage. Um, <laughs> and Lenara and, and Chloe both say Annette over and over again, which I think is quite funny. <laughs> and we can stim visually by looking at something like a lava lamp slowly moving. The list of stims of, are endless, and there's no I just right want to say, I do way. all of them. All of them. You do all of them, yeah. <laughs> I definitely do all of them as well. I, I've been stimming while we've been doing the talk, is definitely. I know, and that's the thing. No, it probably looks like I've been sitting here really calmly the whole time, but my leg is jiggling. I've got objects on. Um, so from here up, it looks very still and professional, but from there down, it's all the stimming. And then all I can think of is going, Annette! <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and I have, I've been trying to stim because I know it makes, I get anxious when I do things like this. So, you know, I've been trying to stim and, and then I think, well, maybe I should make it obvious that I'm stimming. So people realize that that is something that autistic people do. And we, you know, it is really important to do that um, to, to, as a coping mechanism as well. Um, and then Nara, I was going to say, the Nara's yeah. stimming with her toothpick. Yeah. She's always... Yeah. Now, yeah, and, and yeah, everything throughout this session. Which, I, if people just think she looks, why, why is she, why is she cleaning her teeth during this session? Well, actually, it's a stim thing. It makes the narrow. And bite in the end. Yeah. yeah. I didn't even notice that. Yeah. So, so talking about basically, we've discovered that stimming on a regular basis, even if it's just well, at first maybe five minutes a week or I mean ultimately five minutes a day or doing it when you are stressed um, can really help autistic people with their well-being, um, can stop overwhelm, um, not necessarily stop overwhelm, but but kind of guard you against it in some way because you're you're consciously regulating your stimulation on a regular basis um, that can help you. Ultimately all autistic people will be overwhelmed um, and have maybe meltdowns or shutdowns to a certain extent um, throughout their lives. But, but stimming definitely can help, um, especially, you know, if you find pleasure in stimming, which a lot of autistic people do. Um, once you kind of get over, you know, as a late autist, late diagnosed person, what, how weird do you think it might be? Um, because people told you it was weird your whole life. Um, so, but yeah, so we discovered that it's really great. So we kind of came up with this thing of mindful stimming. So we were hoping that you guys would kind of do this task with us. Um, all you need is some kind of object that you can stim with. And obviously this can be anything from a toothpick to, I've got a little, um, what are these called, Chloe? They're called? The acupressure ring. Acupressure rings, yeah. And um, that just plays on your finger, but it could be a ring. It could be a necklace. It could be a bracelet. I mean, I was just stimming with this, which is my hairband um, for much of the session. Um, so it can be anything you have and just kind of find a comfortable place to sit. So just make that quite clear. Yeah, go ahead. What we really like now is just for this five minutes, Annette's going to guide us through a mindful stim meditation. Um, and like she says, you can have absolutely any object in front of you. It could be a set of keys, it could be your phone. If you do have an object that you quite like, so this is one of my favorites, it's this little squishy cucumber. Um, my sister will probably be stimming with her toothpick thing. So we're gonna do this now, and um, Lenara and I are gonna do it along with Annette. So um, just to, if you're still watching, obviously see how, how you could do it in your home. So we're gonna, gonna go with it. Yeah. So I'm just gonna be asking you, um, different things to consider about the object um, and basically it's about learning how to stem I suppose so one of the first things I like to just talk about is to remember what it's like to be a child and play playing is something that all human beings do as children and then usually for some reason are told at some point that you're too old to play and I became an artist to learn how to play again and to remember my fascination with the sensory world and to enjoy life, to notice things that most people don't see. So I'm going to kind of ask you to think about that and to notice things that you normally wouldn't look at. So have a look at your object, place it in your hand. And just have a look at it. And I want you to note the weight of your object. Is it heavy or light? Is it warm or cold on your hand? How does it feel on your hand? Just rub your object on the palm of your hand. But then you could also rub it on the other side of your hand, the top of your hand. What is the difference? I always want to rub objects against my lips. That's something that I always do. But obviously, during this time, not everybody's going to want to do that. How does it, the object, look to you in the light? Kind of hold it up to the light. 
Does it reflect light? Can you see light kind of playing on it or does it absorb light? How does it look when you look at it in the light? Can you see different elements of it that you didn't see before? Does your object smell? Does it have a smell? Okay, what can you do with your object? Does it have moving parts? Can it spin? Can it change shape? Are you noticing different things about it while it's moving? Does it, do you like the way it feels against your skin? And now just find something about the object that you like doing. It might be a movement that you found or you might like rubbing it against a certain part of your skin, whatever it is, and just have a play with your object. If you discover new things, that's okay. And just kind of give in to the object. And the pleasure that you're getting from watching it or playing with it. Okay, now stop stimming. Okay, come back to the world. Okay, so what was it like to be stopped stimming? Obviously for us, and we I kind of <laughs> knew it was coming as well, but... Um, yeah, so Annette and I had talked about wanting people to realize the importance of stimming um, and how you can get absorbed in it and how it can be quite relaxed in um, and then what it's like to be pulled out of it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I wonder. I didn't know it was coming. <laughs> how did you feel, Nora? Were you quite relaxed? And then, because I had my eyes closed towards the end. So what were you doing towards the end with your object? Being in it. Twing. You're twinging it. Twinging it. I didn't know it was coming, so it's fine. <laughs> Were you quite relaxed? Were you quite calm? Oh, yeah. I'm always relaxed and calm. No, I'm joking. But that was relaxing. <laughs> and then how did you feel when Annette pulled you out of it, like, all of a sudden? Well, um, a bit of an anticlimax, really. A bit of an anticlimax. Climax, huh? yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the calm was gone. Yeah, Annette and I have done done mindful stimming with lots of different groups, and we've done it with lots of um, non autistic parents, professionals, like all sorts of people. And we tend to do it not quite the same way, it's a bit different because obviously we're doing it online today. Um, But what we would normally do is let people get really relaxed, and um, ideally, we tell them to sit away from other people, sit with their eyes closed. Um, and then people really get into it. And then we gently say, okay, can half this half of the room just go and sit 
with the other stimmers and see what they're doing without interrupting them. Then we ask them to right, take a thumb away from a child. Yeah. 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 And then you yeah. ask questions. We say, right, ask that person about their object and things like that. Um, and then when we've completely finished the, the mindful stimming and the interaction afterwards, we ask, how did people feel when the person had to come over and sit next to them? And it's always oh. they feel intruded on, they feel um, self-conscious, they feel interrupted because they were actually quite calm and enjoying what they were doing. Hmm. Um, and then we ask them, well, what did you feel about when you started talking about your objects? And then they actually feel quite happy because they're like, they got to share what they really enjoyed about the object. Um, and the purpose really is to give people just a tiny idea, nowhere near the same, but an idea of what it's like to interrupt an autistic person who is hyper-focusing, who is stimming, who is doing something that their brain is actually really focused on. Um, and then you trying to pull them out of it. So Yeah, I mean, actually someone described it the other day as making their brain feel nice stimming mm. which i think is a really nice description of what it does yeah um and to remember that that actually that's making an autistic brain person's brain feel nice um instead of overwhelmed and anxious um and that's that's got to be a really good thing and to interrupt somebody and and say what are you doing why are you doing that you know we need to be we have to go eat lunch or we need to go to the shops or you know you should be studying um is, is really actually quite disturbing and can kind of create, you know, all that calm that was created by the stimming can then just be gone in a second. Um, so it's about finding ways to kind of quietly, maybe just maybe stim wind them for a minute and you might calm down a little bit well, <laughs> because yeah. I think it's calming for everyone. I guess to think of it more like meditation and how somebody who's guiding a meditation would very, very gently pull you out of that meditation bit by bit as opposed to go from calm to um, really aware would is very jolting isn't it so mm. um yeah hopefully people are kind of and also like meditation in that you you have a practice of meditation that you do um and that you know as an adult that is something with stimming that can be very important for autistic people to allow themselves to stim and kind of make themselves stim. <laughs> okay. I think, so, yeah. yeah. Even with kids, it's about, you know, maybe they have stim time every day where they're, they can stim for a half an hour and not be interrupted. You know, you will not say anything to them or do anything. Um, that might be a helpful thing. Yeah. Hmm. So thank you very much for that, Annette. Um, and so that concludes our um, academy and discussion. So the journey of autistic women, well, this, these four autistic women anyway, um, obviously there will be so much variability. So um, hopefully you've enjoyed this. If you don't already follow Academy, please do. Um, and we are always bringing in new educative videos and live streams um, and posting things about autistic experience from an autistic person's perspective. So um, hopefully we'll see you on the page another time. And if you want to help support these kind of educative videos um, and support the work that we're doing at Academy, please do consider donating um, just a pound would be great um, if you've enjoyed this video and want to support um, the work that we're doing. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye, Bye from Jess who had to disappear. Yeah. <laughs>